Now, Margaret Hodge does need an introduction. Just to counter the usual way. Of Thank you. <laughs> it's not because you don't know who she is and the fact that she's been MP for Barking and Dagenham for a long time now. 20 long. years. 20 years. And I'm sure you also all know that against the trend at the last general election, she doubled her majority. You might... <laughs> yeah, we're in applauding mode. <laughs> You might not know, actually interesting for the college, that Margaret was Minister for Lifelong Learning uh -huh. for a couple of years under the last Labour government. And I was actually out of the country for, during that period, so I can register very strongly what you did as Minister, Margaret, but anyway, it was significant. But most of us uh, know Margaret for now, although she's reinvented herself several times from Islington Council to Minister and so on, now as Chair of the Public Accounts Committee. And I do want to say, Margaret, I mean, it gives me a sort of personal, visceral feeling of pleasure when each time you land a blow <laughs> on many of these people and all power to your elbow Thank you. for carrying on doing that. That's probably enough of a sort of pugilistic <laughs> metaphor from me, but it really is a terrific job. So great pleasure in welcoming you to talk about morality and taxation. Thank you. very much indeed for that very warm welcome and I'm really pleased to be here and to see so many of you it's great so um, I'm going to just say two things a little bit about the select committee so that you understand the context in which we've carried out this work I chair the public accounts committee it doesn't sound the most sexy of things when I took it took it on but it is known by Peter Hennessy as the queen of the select committees it's the oldest one it was founded by Gladstone in 1861 and although Peter Hennessy called it the Queen of Select Committees. I'm actually the very first woman, and therefore the very first legitimate woman. Right. <laughs> I've got a stunning room on the upper committee corridor in Parliament, and along one wall I've got photos of my predecessors, and among them was Harold Wilson, and I couldn't quite work out in my brain why he was interested in chairing the Public Accounts Committee, till I discovered that in his day, uh, MPs didn't have rooms. They had those old-fashioned Victorian desks with attached chairs in the corridors of Westminster. The only person to get a room was the chair of the Public Accounts Committee, <laughs> so he took the job to get the room. And the other thing that I discovered is that there have been more chairs of Public Accounts Committees who've been assassinated than there have been <laughs> prime ministers. There was one of the Guinness family who was assassinated at the end of the Second World War, and one of the Cavendish family, who was, assassinate, who was a victim of the Phoenix Park murders. So I'm now waiting for Google to have a pop at me and uh, <laughs> make, make me the third one. Um, it, the committee's always chaired by a member of the opposition, but it reflects Parliament, so I've got a majority of Conservatives on my committee. Um, I am the first person ever to have it been elected to the post. Before that, the post was always in the gift of uh, party leaders and party whips. And that gives me an independence uh, and authority, which I don't think people had previously in the post. And I'm elected for five years. So I always say that uh, Tom said that I was a minister under the Blair Brown government. And I was privileged to do that. But every summer, I'd be there biting my nails. I have better security of tenure as chair of the Public <laughs> Accounts Committee than anywhere else. And the final thing to say, people think we've got lots of power. And we can invite people to come and give evidence to us which we regularly do, if they, uh, if they turn down our invitation, we can then order them to come and give evidence to us. And I'm a bit nervous about that, because you basically sign a bit of paper like this. So I sort of said to my clerk one day, so what happens if they just ignore the bit of paper? To which um, he replied, well, in that case, you have the power to commit them for a period of imprisonment in the Tower of London. <laughs> <laughs> I think finally, just before we get on to tax, that we're seeing a, resur a resurgence in the importance of select committees in Parliament, and I welcome that. And I put it down to a number of things. I may be wrong in my analysis, but I just think it's interesting to reflect. First of all, it's because we're elected. I'm elected, all my members are elected as well. I'm elected by the whole House, the members by the, par uh, by the political parties. I think the other thing is post-expenses scandal. Um, people want to sort of reassert the importance and relevance of Parliament in our democratic infrastructure. And I think that's helped them try and 
uh, to sort of leave their tribal loyalties at the committee door and really think for themselves a, a little bit more. And I think that's been helped by coalition politics. I don't know if I'm right about this, but it just feels to me that those tribal loyalties have broken down a little bit and greater independence um, has emerged. And I hope, I just hope, it's a, a lecture for another day, but I hope it's a reflection of people finding a new way of doing politics so we don't all stay on message, just do what we're told to by party leaders, but we think for ourselves a little bit more and um, uh, find a different way of representing our values and, uh, and our constituents in Parliament. We always follow the taxpayer's pound. That's my mantra, which it means that I've been really privileged. I've learned so much in the last four, four and a half, five years about public expenditure. So this week, for example, we're doing inquiries. We've done one yesterday. We had a, did have a hit on a, on a, um, a Durand uh, a school in Lambeth, which um, um, has really abused public money with a head walking away with something in the region of... He, he gets about £360,000 a year uh, of public money to run a primary school. Um, we're looking uh, tomorrow at the Charity Commission and at Rural Broadband. It's about the third time we've come back to that. And we've published three reports this week, one on an IT system in, uh, in HMRC, one on the resilience of local government, and we're publishing another report at the end of the week on um, the way in which... Uh, the uh, development money is being spent or not very well spent on projects on infrastructure pro um, uh, projects in developing countries. Mm -hmm. Now the interesting thing is all our reports are unanimous and that's because wherever you are on the political spectrum you do have a shared interest and value for money. Either you want to cut the size of the state or if you're on the left what you want is to prove the worth of public expenditure because of its importance in transforming and equalizing life chances. We have the National Audit Office who provides reports for us, but they're auditors. They're not really, they don't really have a value system that they bring to the work. And in America, I've, our committee is supported, our equivalent is supported by 120 people just working to the committee. National Audit Office works to itself. Um, I, uh, 80 work to the majority party, 20, uh, 40 to the minority party. I have one absolutely brilliant researcher who's been with me for six years, and she and I really concoct how we're going to manage the thing. And actually, in a way, although I'd like more resources, what it means is that we do, again, keep that crude party politics away from the committee, and I think it's a strength. And what it has taught me is how important things like whistleblowers, and I think I'm probably the only MP in Parliament who likes the odd journalists, particularly if they're investigative journalists. <laughs> Uh, turning now to tax. Tax is a huge issue, and we didn't go for it deliberately. We uh, uh, we just it was almost by uh, it wasn't mistake, but it was by chance that we um, lighted on it. So we're concerned with following the taxpayers' pound, and it's as much about getting it in as it is about how we spend it. And the sums that we don't get in, the tax avoidance gap, that gap between what we should get in and what we actually get in, is massive and growing. If you talk to HMRC, they now say it's about £34 billion. If you talk to tax campaigners, they talk about in excess of £100 billion. So even if you took a figure somewhere in the middle, you're talking about £70 billion of tax that is not collected, that could be used for the common purse, uh, purse for the common good. And 25% uh, of that gap comes from big corporations. So a lot of it is the big corporate tax avoidance. And the other thing to say about it is every year, HMRC writes off five billion pounds officially in their accounts, and they write off and hide another 10 billion pounds, which they know they can't collect. So every year, 15 billion pounds is written off, really, from tax that could be used to provide public services. And I think at a time when everybody's struggling, when everybody's uh, feeling the cuts in, in, in services impacting on their lives, when it looks as if the deficit's going to be with us for a while to come, and therefore cuts are going to continue, I think it's just deeply offensive to see rich people, powerful people, big corporations getting away with not paying, especially when 85% of us pay automatically our tax through the PAYE system. 
The agenda we've evolved is not, as it's often said, an anti-business or anti-aspiration agenda. Indeed, I think I would argue that it's a pro-British business and pro-British jobs agenda. Because if uh, Starbucks doesn't pay its tax and undercuts the local community cafe in Camden High Street, it kills off that local community cafe. And similarly with Amazon, if Amazon can undercut, a more clear one actually, if Amazon undercuts its book prices and therefore takes away business from a community bookshop, again, you're killing small UK businesses and destroying uh, UK jobs. And all these big companies, they all use the services. They want a trained workforce. They want a healthy workforce. They want the infrastructure uh, to be there. Uh, and so they should put their bit in as much as the rest of us. And the final thing that really gets my goat when businesses say to me, but we all pay other taxes, so they pay their contribution, uh, employer's contribution to PAY, to uh, national insurance, and they pay uh, um, business rates. Well, we all pay VAT on everything we buy in the shops, and we all pay our council tax, and we don't think that's an excuse for not paying your um, income tax. And they likewise should understand that there's a variety of uh, responsibilities which they to which they've got to, uh, to adhere. Now, the key today is: is it a moral issue, or is it, or is it, a, or not? And for me, it's both a legal and a moral issue. And let me see if I can convince you in my argument. When you live in a society, in a community, in let's call it a tax jurisdiction, you all, we all agree to abide by a sort of system of rules and regulations which make all our lives better. So everybody gets something out um, by agreeing with, uh, with, with the rules of the community in which we live. Everybody gains. And if everybody gains, everybody similarly has an obligation to contribute to the system. So everybody has to give. And ironically, I think that's especially true for the very rich people. Because if, they, if we didn't all abide by the rules, the people who'd lose most is the people who make most out of the system. And they are the richest in our society. So one of these rules that we have that hold us together as the communities and society. One aspect of the compact is that we all enter uh, into, as members of the community, is that we give according to our means to the common pot for the common good. And how much you give is decided collectively through, uh, through uh, democratic processes. And if you opt out of that, if you fail to pay your fair share, if you ignore your obligations, you're ignoring the democratic decision-making. And in my view, you're acting immorally. Especially so because most of us can't choose. If the 85% who pay PA automatically through their PAYE can't opt out, can't find clever ways to avoid tax, surely it's immoral and wrong for the few, for the very rich, to be able to find ways to avoid and the rest of us not to be able to do that. And when tax avoiders argue to me that they're simply obeying the law, that really does get me angry. Uh, they always say, if the lawmakers get it right, uh, we would do it. Because I believe it's that to be a really pathetic excuse of avoiding their responsibility and paying their dues. Now, of course, it's right that us, we as lawmakers, I as an MP, should do my best to go, try and get the laws as clear and as unambiguous as I can. And of course we always try to do that. But the idea that you can create unambiguous and completely watertight tax laws is simply impractical. It's impossible to set up a set of tax rules that are so tight that they cover every eventuality. And actually, if you think about it, you wouldn't have this army of tax accountants, lawyers, and endless advisors all making a very, very healthy living out of identifying the ambiguities or in the language or the ambiguities interpretation to promote uh, tax avoidance through loopholes. And even if we wrote a thousand pages on every little bit of the law to try and cover every ambiguity in every circumstance, I think they'd still find a way around it. What is immoral to me, what is, I think, reprehensible and unacceptable is that this army of talented folk 
spend their working lives helping big corporations and rich individuals to act against the intention of the law. They know what was intended. They deliberately thwart the intentions of Parliament, and that is, in my view, acting immorally. I'll just share with you as an example that I was trying to think of of this. So let's take an example that we decide we're going to introduce a new tax relief. Anybody over six foot gets um, uh, an extra 100 quid a year in their tax, just to keep it simple. So you end up, how do you measure people? Do you measure them in the morning when we're a little bit taller or in the evening when we're a little bit shorter? What do you do about shoes and certainly high heels if you're a uh, challenge like me on my height? What angle are you going to measure people at? Because that can make a difference to the height they have. And what on earth do you do with women's back-combed bouffants? Do you add those in or don't you? Now, I use that as an example, but it demonstrates how difficult it is, actually, to define in law an unambiguous way. You're clear what you intend to do. It's much more, um, uh, 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 much more difficult to get it absolutely right. And I think if it's impossible to eliminate ambiguity, we all have a moral obligation to stick by the intention of the law and deliberately interpreting the law with the sole purpose of avoiding tax is, I think, immoral. I'm going to take you through what we've discovered in our uh, work around this area. All we've been able to do is to shine a light on the issues around tax avoidance. We have no powers, but we've been able to stimulate a debate. And for me, what's been so interesting is with this little bit of power, what a huge impact we've had. In fact, it's a bit of a self-serving story, but I'll tell it nevertheless. I went to the OECD in Paris to talk to them about what rules they should change internationally to deal with global companies. And they've been working on this, all this stuff about people taking their um, uh, uh, profits uh, into low-tax jurisdiction. They've been working on this since the 1980s, which, if you think about it, makes sense, because that's when globalization really started taking hold. But nobody noticed they were doing this work really until people like us and other jurors, other parliaments elsewhere started investigating and drawing attention to the issues. So I had this really interesting day of discussions with them. And at the end, the uh, couple of people who lead this work in the OECD said, can we have a, a photo with you, Margaret? And I said, yeah, you can. I don't know quite you want it, why you want it. And the woman said to me, Margaret, you do not understand. You are the tax rock star here in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just tell you, if I may, some other stories. We, all, we started on this journey with Goldman Sachs. Now, the only thing I knew about Goldman Sachs was what I let him, read in Private Eye, my new Bible for doing this job. <laughs> and Private Eye told me there'd been a sweetheart deal. So what we did was we, we had regular sessions with the head of tax in HMRC. We had him up. And we started saying, asking him questions. We said to him, did you get involved in the sweetheart deal with Goldman Sachs? He said, I had nothing to do with Goldman Sachs' tax affairs. And then he said, but I can't talk to you about it because of confidentiality of taxpayers' interests. Frustrating session. We went away, and that following day, I got another big brown envelope uh, from a whistleblower. And it was a big bundle of papers from a lawyer who worked in H HMRC. And among them was one paper, which was important, and it was the minutes of a meeting that had been held by the head of law in HMRC. And he said, and in this minute it said that the head of tax had shaken hands on the deal, so the guy had misled Parliament, lied to Parliament, and that the deal, in the view of the head of law, was unconscionable. That was pretty strong evidence, so he hauled back the head of tax asked him questions, and he just avoided everything, saying, can't talk to you about confidentiality, taxpayers' interest. So we then hauled in the head of law, and he was being so evasive and, you know, long-winded and just telling us nothing. Sitting next to me is my, in effect, vice chair, who's a Tory MP from, uh, uh, in Norfolk, and uh, he's been on the committee for about 12 years, 30 years, and he whispered to me, put the guy on oath. And I'd only been in the committee for about a year or so, and I said, I can't do that. He said, yes, you can. So I turned to the uh, um, clerk whilst our, our witness was down the other end of the table babbling away, and said, can I put him on oath? So he said, yes, you can. So I said, well, go and get a Bible. 
<laughs> it took them 20 minutes to find a Bible in the Palace of Westminster. When they finally did, we put the guy on oath. It didn't get much more out of him, but the head of tax did leave the government service about a couple of weeks later. Following on that, a really brilliant um, uh, investigative journalist from Reuters came to see me to tell me the Starbucks story. And if I, if I can do this, yeah, I can, I'll just, it's worth knowing the details. So Starbucks, they've been active in the UK for 18, 19 years, expanded massively. They talk to their shareholders about how well they're doing in the UK. They are doing well. And uh, they took the head of the UK Starbucks and put him into America because he was doing so well. Yet year on year on year, every year, they were filing accounts in Companies House, which showed that they were making a loss. So how are they doing that? Three ways. First of all, they had their brand registered in Holland, and they'd done a deal with the Dutch tax authorities. And they made, they pay, you had to pay to use the brand. And that was a way of exporting profit to Holland, where, which is a low tax jurisdiction. 6% of the profits went out to pay for the brand to Holland. Then they bought, they claimed to buy their coffee beans through Switzerland. I don't think a coffee bean ever actually hit the, the Swiss uh, 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 country. But they bought through Switzerland, and there was a 20% markup on that, another low tax jurisdiction. So another 20% of the profit goes out um, to Switzerland. And the third thing is they had their head office in a tax haven. I can never remember whether it was Bermuda or something like that. And you had to borrow for capital investment from the company headquarters in Bermuda. And they charged for that borrowing interest rates well above anything for the greediest bank in any UK high street would charge. But it was another way in paying that interest rate that you took profits out of the UK and put them into the tax haven. So in those three ways, by exporting the profits through completely artificial means, they uh, were then able to show in the UK that they had made no profit and therefore avoided tax. So I was so shocked by this story. I said, we've got to see these guys. And then I thought, we can't really see them on their own. we better see them with somebody else. So we had a list of uh, um, the papers were beginning to cover tax avoidance and a little bit uh, bigger thing. And I looked, and actually Amazon looked the most obvious one to do. I no longer use Amazon, but in the days that I did, and those of you that might still be doing so, if you open an Amazon um, uh, email, you'll see Amazon.uk co.uk about five times on the email and you know that they're, they're, the books are coming some warehouse outside London and you know they're coming in a royal mail, ex-royal mail van and you know they've got a, uh, the Queen's Head stamp on it but yet they tell you that all, it's all being done from um, uh, Luxembourg. Uh, so I rang Amazon, or we rang, my clerk rang Amazon, they couldn't make the date and I was quite keen to keep to our timetable. So I said, well let's try Google. They couldn't make the date either, so I was forced to change the date. And then, I, they, then the clerk said, well, who should we have? So I said, oh, well, let's have all three. So the advent of Amazon, Google, and Starbucks was, again, a sort of uh, mistake. But just say, to say to you, Google, in the, in the year that we saw them, uh, they, they, UK revenue is £4 billion. Their global profits are not, were £9.7 billion, and they paid a mere £6 million in... Um, corporation tax to the UK. And with Google, I remain to this day really angry with them, particularly as I've just got an email today saying they're going to train all us MPs to, to be savvy, you know, spending money on that savvy with, um, uh, with uh, new technology. We had two whistleblowers on Google. Uh, we had lots of whistleblowers, but two who we used. One was a guy who'd been a manager in Google for four years, and when he'd left, he downloaded all his stuff off the computer. <laughs> so he had his sales plans, he had invoices sent out from a London address, um, he had everything. And the other one was an employee who was a salesman, and he had his uh, wage slips, and they showed that the basic wage was about 50% of his earnings, <coughs> and the other was all on commission. So to pretend that he wasn't actually... Uh, do what Google says, they're not doing business in Britain, they're doing business into Britain. To pretend that with the evidence we got, I think it's a nonsense. And to this day, I cannot understand why HMRC are not taking court in the way that the French are and that now probably Europe is. So we had that session with those three. 
We then moved on and we looked at something else. One of the extraordinary um, features of the UK tax system is that we have 1,040 tax reliefs, uh, which are all reliefs that are set in there to achieve some change in the economy. Every tax release is an opportunity for tax avoidance, every single one. And the one that I think uh, we found most awful was we looked at gift aid tax relief. Now, we all do that little tick in the box for the gift aid tax relief. Um, uh, actually, gift aid tax relief gives charities about a billion pounds. It costs the taxpayer in the relief that individuals get nearly the same. It's about 940 million pounds. And the real shocker we came across was this company who, again, were based in a tax haven, and um, they set themselves up. The company was the trustee uh, to the uh, trustee, the sole trustee to the charity. The company was called NT Advisors, no <coughs> tax advisors. And um, he, this guy put £170 million through the charity. He gave one grant for £15,000 to a youth um, project, but he claimed something like £46 million in um, charitable tax relief on it. And that just demonstrates to you how um, ev you know everything that you do in this tax, all this thing about getting the law right, it demonstrates to you how that is exploited. We also um, had a session with uh, what were called the boutique advisors. These are the guys who support Jimmy Carr. And this was perhaps one of the most extraordinary sessions where this guy they were sitting there in front of us, and I turned to the first witness and said, so tell me about your business model. And his response was, well, I do tax avoidance. So I thought, oh, blimey, at least that's honest. And what this man do does, he's, uh, he dreams up a new scheme, or he gets somebody to dream up a new scheme. He then goes off and gets it signed off by a lawyer. I don't know how many lawyers we've got here, but I don't even name the lawyers here, because there are about six of them, QCs, who do this signing off. Uh, and I have named them in Parliament, but they've threatened to sue me for libel if I name them elsewhere. Um, uh, and they, once you've got that signature, you can market the scheme. So he markets the scheme, and by the time HMRC catches up with him, he's made such a lot of money out of it that he doesn't really care that HMRC close it down. So every single scheme he's run has been closed down. He's had six schemes over the years, but he is a very, very, very rich man. And finally, the, we had this session. In fact, we've had two sessions with the big four accountants. They are just, um, I think, and I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers for a couple of years, not as an accountant, but as a public sector consultant. I think their behavior in tax is just, I mean, I, it's, it's one of my campaigns that I'm just going to get this sorted out. They make £2 billion pounds a year out of tax advice here in the UK, here in the UK alone. When they uh, put forward a scheme, they put it forward not n knowing that it's not a copper bottom scheme, i.e. that it's definitely uh, legal and it's definitely within the spirit of the legislation and intentions of Parliament. As long as there's a 50% chance that it doesn't get challenged, they'll, uh, they'll uh, advise and commend it to their uh, clients. And a lot of this stuff is about taking money out of the UK, into getting money out into the low-tax jurisdictions. And it's called transfer pricing, is the technical term for it. The, the big four have 250 experts in transfer pricing, just, just the big four. HMRC, to deal with the big four and everybody else, has 65 people. So it's a real David and Goliath uh, battle. And then I have two stories, one of which we did some time ago, one of which we're going to report at and on in the next couple of weeks. One was a guy from KPMG, apart from KPMG, but it's not KPMG alone, who had gone into Treasury to help them write a new tax relief, a tax relief called patent box. And the idea there is you file a patent, and then clearly we want that patent to be converted into economic activity, jobs and growth. So if you do that, you get a bit tax relief. This guy spent six months in HMRC, in, in Treasury, writing the technical um, uh, uh, clauses around introducing this tax relief. He then came straight out, went back to KPMG, and produced a, bo uh, a brochure saying, patent box, what's in it for you? And it used it entirely as a tax avoidance scheme. 
So one year on, we're changing it to try and close some of the loopholes that he himself wrote and he himself is now exploiting. And then more recently, we uh, had a hearing around the Luxembourg leaks. I don't know if some of you have read about those in the papers. Um, this was a, uh, somebody in PwC leaked a whole lot of do documentation to, and I'm going to get the name wrong, to a group of investigative journalists. journalists. Now, PwC, when they gave advice to it, when they gave evidence to us, said very clearly, and I'll quote them, we do not mass market tax products. We're not in the business of selling schemes. And yet what these leaks showed were 500, uh, nearly 550 letters to Luxembourg authorities on PwC headed note paper seeking authority for what was a tax avoidance. Um, actually, tax avoidance on an industrial scale is the only way I can describe it for 343 of their clients. And again, I always have to put up pictures of them. I should have brought you a picture tonight. You have to almost see a picture of how they invent companies all over the place to really transfer money so you end up having no money in your in your in in the area in the in the jurisdictions where you would pay uh, tax and and pay, paying hardly any tax if any tax at all in the very low tax jurisdictions. Um, we interviewed one of their companies who'd been a company called Shire that uh, is a, a pharmaceutical com uh, conglomerate. But we could have interviewed other of their clients, Amazon, Coca-Cola, Vodafone, Burberry, just to pull out of some of the high-profile names. And if you look at what Shire did, Shire is a huge pharmaceutical company. Its borrows, its external borrowings are 800 million pounds. But it created a web of companies which meant that there were intra companies, so within the company, loans of 10 billion pounds. That's double their sales, uh, 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 one year sales. So they only really needed 800 million, but they created this phony web of intra company role, loans of uh, 10 billion pounds. Um, they employ 5,600 people. They're actually incorporated in Jersey, where nobody's employed. They are domiciled for tax purposes in Ireland, where they employ 100 people. Uh, they've got 300 people in the UK, where they, of course, pay no tax, and America, where they, of course, also pay no tax. They've got two people in Luxembourg looking after these £10 billion pounds worth of loans. Uh, they're paid about £135,000 between them. One of them has 41 other directorships. And the sole purpose of this is to create an artificial structure where you have high-value intra-company loans with no commercial purpose whatsoever, and the only point of it all is to avoid tax. And the tax they pay in Luxembourg is 0.0156%, the 0.01% of, uh, of the turnover. Um, finally, I'm going on a little bit too long. UK government itself. I just want to say a little bit about the UK government. The UK government is talking with forked tongue. I have to be slightly above politics in the in the job I do, but they are creating tax haven sort of conditions here in the UK by the way they're, they're, they too are manipulating a whole set of rules. It's not just that they're bringing corporation tax rates down. Patent Box is an example of how they've created a, a tax avoidance mechanism. That's why Pfizer wanted to come over here. Um, they've also played around with what are called controlled foreign company rules, and they've played around with Eurobonds. And at the moment, the OECD is looking at the UK because it thinks it has harmful tax practices. Actually, I set tax avoidance mechanisms, which will uh, uh, destroy competition and mean that people don't go tax on the profits in the jurisdictions where they make uh, they have their business. So. You know, although Cameron talked about smelling the coffee on the one hand, he's very, very busy on the other hand, uh, creating tax havens. And I have to tell you, um, actually, Starbucks again rang because they're a bit, I think, a bit scared of me. So they rang me up to tell me they were going to put their HQ into into London. I said, oh, great. So uh, are you going to start paying tax? They said, no, no, we're still making a loss. Um, <laughs> I then said, well, how many people are going to come uh, over here then? So he's, I, I, there was a pause. And I said, well, 100? So he said, no, a bit less than that. So I said, 10? So he said, 8. So to take advantage of the UK 
tax avoidance um, uh, schemes that this government has introduced. Starbucks are coming here. They're not paying us any tax, and they're only bringing eight people over. I hardly think that's the way to progress. <laughs> so just the way forward, very, very finely. I think there's a really rich agenda of stuff that we could do to, have to, to tackle that. I mean, clearly, we've got to negotiate internationally. And I think the OECD is doing a fantastic job there to try and rewrite the international rules. That's clearly got to be the way forward. Whether that'll work and how long it will take, we have to wait and see. But they are really doing it. It's all about transparency, uh, transparency about where your, own, where your assets are and how much they're worth, and transparency about where your business is so that you can start paying tax in the jurisdictions where you make your money and make your profits. So that's important. I think the other things we can do is we can simplify our tax system. It is absurd to have so many tax reliefs. Do you know that it's sort of every chancellor of every political party loves them because it's the only way that they can, in, you know, have a little, if you think about budget speeches, how they all bring out their little thing at the end of the day. It's always a tax relief. But these tax reliefs are really expenditure. They cost us money, a hundred billion pounds on these sort of expenditure reliefs that are supposed to have an impact on the economy. And if you really want to even introduce something like a theatre tax, they've introduced a theatre, a regional theatre tax relief recently, why don't you just give the Arts Council a bit more money so that they can fund, uh, uh, fund theatre in, in the regions? That's a much simpler way of doing it, more direct, and isn't open to abuse. So I'd simplify. I'd toughen up HMRC. Every pound we put into into pursuing a void tax that is avoided brings us nine pounds back in revenue. So it's a no-brainer, really. I don't know why we don't do more there. And we are just not aggressive enough. When we looked at this, the HMRC had only taken 60 cases to court. They'd won 51, so they do well, but they just don't challenge sufficiently uh, 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 where, uh, the interpretation of what is, will always be ambiguous legislation. I'd use the power of public procurement. I think it is a scandal that we use taxpayers' money to give uh, private companies uh, uh, an income and profits when those companies refuse to pay their fair share of corporation tax. And I recently said it about that about the BBC in the way that they've handled their property sale and will say it about anybody. I just think it is wrong. Um, I would uh, introduce much greater transparency <coughs> I don't know why all this stuff has to be so secret and confidential. I don't know why we can't know why Vodafone, according to Private Eye, should have paid £6 billion in tax and ended up only paying two and being given five years to pay it back. And I don't think the world would fall apart if we had those negotiations in the open. And I think if we just did it with a FTSE top 100 and the world didn't fall apart, we could then think about rolling out more transparency across the system. And then finally, I'd really have a go at the advisors. Stop the revolving door, i.e. the KPMG in and out. That is just scandalous. And I think just make it an offence for advisors that if they do advise people to adopt a scheme which was contrary to what Parliament intended, uh, when we close down the scheme, they get fined a hefty sum, which might, uh, might in some way stop them doing it. So it's a hugely important issue. What the tax world says is I'm grandstanding, and we do do a bit of grandstanding, I admit to that, but actually the grandstanding, whether it's the Bible or anything else, has helped us actually draw attention to what I think is really, really important, and has helped us uh, um, expose actually what is happening with lots of us. I certainly didn't know all this stuff was going on in my name uh, to, uh, by big companies and by the actions of government and HMRC. So I think the campaign is just on its first steps. I think we've got to go on. But I do think, give it a few years, that this unacceptable behaviour can be taken out of our system. And then, you know, if you're on the left, we'll have more money to spend on public services. If, on your, if you're on the right, you might want to cut, cut taxes. But for me, I go for equalising life chances. Thank you.